All right, with uh, chapter nine behind us, it's up to it's uh, it's about time to uh, kick it up a notch. So, um, everything we did in chapter eight and chapter nine falls into the framework of what we would call sort of one sample. That is, we were always just sampling a single variable. We were always sampling that variable from a single group. So we just had like heights of students, for example. But in practice, we're often comparing multiple samples, often two samples. So, right, maybe instead of just looking at the average height of students, where we pull from a sample of students, maybe we're looking at the average heights of males and females. So now we have two different samples. We have males, we have females. We take a sample from each of those groups, and now we have two samples. And our goal with two samples often is to compare the two. So we take two samples from two different groups. We wanna use those samples to compare those groups. It starts to get a little laborious. So like all the concepts that we've learned kind of pretty naturally roll over. The formulas start getting a lot more daunting. So in chapters eight and nine, I did put a decent amount of emphasis on formulas. By the time you hit chapters 10 and 11, especially as like a practicing statistician, as an applied researcher, like no one's doing these formulas by hand. So at this point, we're really kind of really relying on our calculators and our software programs to kind of do these comparisons for us. And so our book kind of, again, kind of parallels the journey we've already taken. We'll see that chapters 10 are devoted to doing confidence intervals comparing two groups. And then chapter 11 is devoted to hypothesis tests for comparing two groups. Probably hypothesis tests is the more natural way of comparing two groups. Um, it's my opinion. So the confidence intervals kind of hang in there. They might feel a little bit, um, a little bit convoluted, but I think once we get to chapter 11, maybe hopefully things will feel a little bit more natural. So, uh, so these homework problems come from 10.1 and 10.3. Um, so that's confidence intervals for the difference between two means. 10.1 is we have what's called independent samples, and 10.3 is where they're coming from, what we would call paired samples. We talk about that distinction, I think, in the narrated PowerPoints uh, going over the course material. Uh, so, so first problems from 10.1, just some kind of fill in, the fill in the blank problems. When observations in one sample do not influence observations in another, that's, that's the 10.1 um, scenario. That means they're independent of one another. And then seven, the point estimate, right? Point estimate is just a fancy name for best guess. The, 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 the best guess for the difference in population means is the sum of sample means. That feels a little fishy to me and it is in fact false. The best guess is the difference in sample means, right? So if I wanna know what the population mean for the first group is minus the population mean for the second group, my, my best guess for that is going to be the sample mean from the first group minus the sample mean from the second group. That should hopefully be a little bit intuitive to us. All right, so here's number nine. Number nine is like just a generic problem. Again, just focusing on the fundamentals. Um, here I kind of sketch this out. Uh, we find confidence intervals for the difference um, of means for independent samples, which is what 10.1 is all about, using one of two functions. So not surprisingly, if the population standard deviations are known, that's gonna be a, a, a Z situation. So we're gonna do two samp Z int, right? Because chapter 10 is all about confidence intervals. We have two samples, we're using a Z statistic and we're doing a confidence interval. If on the other hand, the population standard deviations are unknown, we're going to use two SAMP T int. So when they're unknown, we use the sample standard deviations that changes a Z to a T. And so we have to use the two sample T interval. 
Now, when we're doing the T interval, you'll see in your calculator, there's like an option. It says use pooled standard deviations or not pooled standard deviations. Um, it's a little bit of like a technical thing. The difference between pooling and not pooling often is not that large of a difference. Um, we're not going to worry too much about that, like in our very basic introductory class. Um, but for us, we will always select pooled equals no, which is what you would typically do in practice unless you had um, some type of rationale or some type of justification for pooling. So there's a lot of information to actually fill in when we pick two SAMP um, T end. Actually, I think more than I could fit onto a single screen. So there's actually, I, I put some of the information you have to fill in. There's actually more than that. So I, I think I've, I filled in the top information then scrolled down to that pooled equals option. Uh, but there's also some information above hand, but hopefully that should be okay for you to do on your own. I mean, it's just a straightforward copying of information provided by the textbook. So um, looks like number of people in our first group, the book told us was 26. Sample mean from our second group was 92.9. Sample standard deviation. So notice in, in, in problem number nine, if we look at it, it gives us S's. S's mean sample standard deviation. So that's what guided me to the two sample T end. The book told me to do 90% confidence. And remember I said, we're always gonna do pooled equals no. So I put all that in, I hit calculate. And there's my answer. So my answer is, um, my confidence interval is from 8.575 to uh, 14. 0.825. So we would say that we are 90% confident that the difference in population means is somewhere between 8.575 and 14.825. This is actually equivalent to saying that we're 90% confident that the first group's average, that the average for the first group is larger than the second group how much larger somewhere between 8.5 and 14.8 um, alternatively we can sort of look at it this way since anytime that interval does not include the value zero which ours doesn't right it's all positive so zero is not inside that interval. Anytime the interval does not include zero, we could actually conclude that the first mean is larger than the second. I'll elaborate on that a little bit, I think, in an upcoming slide. So here's a word problem, maybe more along the lines of what you might see on a test. Um, a group of 78 people enrolled in a weight loss program. Um, it involved a special diet and a special exercise program. And they did it for six months, and we saw that on average, they lost 25 pounds. Good for them. With a sample standard deviation, so boom, there's the keyword that's telling me a T interval, or at least a T something, of nine pounds. We have a second group of people, and they went on the diet but didn't do the exercise. So we're actually, I guess, looking at the impact of exercise. Does exercise matter, or is, is diet the only thing that matters? We also measured their weight loss after six months, and we found it was 14 pounds, again, with a sample standard deviation, boom, sample standard deviation tells me a T, not a Z, of seven pounds. And then maybe I should have bolded that last sentence, because that's what's telling me to do an interval rather than a hypothesis test. It says do a 95% confidence interval for the mean difference in weight loss. So again, Right, I got to kind of scroll off the screen, um, but there's, there's all the information that was provided. First group lost 25 pounds, standard deviation of nine. There's 78 people in that group. Uh, second group lost 14 pounds. Their standard deviation was seven. There's 43 people in that group. Confidence levels 95%. I think if you scroll down a little bit more, there's an option for pooled, yes or no. So remember, we'd select no for that. And there's our interval. Actually, it looks like it's it's kind of close. Um, it's kind of close numerically to the interval from the last problem, uh, eight point zero seven three nine to thirteen point nine two six. So I'll I'll take that and interpret it on the next slide. 
Uh, we are 95% confident that the true difference of mean weight loss between the two regimens is somewhere between 8.0739 pounds and 13.926 pounds. Again, this interval does not include zero, so that implies that the first group, that's the diet and exercise group, lost the most weight on average. In fact, how much more did they lose? We could say that, that they did somewhere between 8.0739 and 13.926 pounds better. They lost that much more on average. Now, a little rationale for that second bullet point is on the next slide. So there's the rationale, right? So if the difference in means, if that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero, so here we're talking about the entire interval. So if the entire interval is greater than zero, which means it does not include zero, then it's just a little bit of algebraic rearranging. I just add mu2 to both sides of that equation. Right, that implies that mu1 is greater, is better than mu2. Ta-da! Right, so when the entire interval is greater than zero, that implies that the first group is larger than the second group. That the average for the first group is larger than the average for the second group. And then just 10.3 is just kind of... Um, helping you appreciate or be able to spot the distinction between paired or unpaired, paired or independent. Again, I talk about this, I think, in greater depth in the uh, the narrated PowerPoints um, that goes over the course material. Um, but if we had a study where we had twins, that would be a paired study. So I don't know, if we're looking at weight loss of twins, Right, we might look at how much did one twin lose, how much did the other twin lose, and we would look at the difference between those two twins. We would pair the twins together. Uh, B, if we were comparing students taught by two different methods, say online versus non-online, that would probably be independent, right? That is, the students in the online class probably have nothing to do, no natural pairing with the students in the non-online class. So if we wanted to compare an online class to a non-online class in terms of how well they do, say, on a comprehensive final, we would use the independent process to do that. That's, the, that's actually the types of examples we just did. If we wanted to compare the height of men versus women, probably that would be an independent. So, right, we would take a sample of men, we would take a sample of women, we would look at the average heights of both samples and then go ahead and do our comparison again, right? In most situations, there's probably not a natural pairing of a man to a woman. That is the men in one group probably have nothing to do with the women in, in the second group. And then D is like a little bit subtle, but this would be another um, kind of classic example of, of a pairing. What if we wanted to look at apartment rents over two years? That would probably be paired, right? So technically we're comparing two different years, right? Say 2018 to 2019. But right for every observation in 2018, Presumably, assuming that apartment didn't go out of business, we would also have an observation in 2019, right? So we have a natural pairing. We could basically, for every apartment, we could say, did the rent go up or down, basically, right? So we have the rent in 2018. We have the rent in 2019. We can pair that information. And instead of looking at it as two numbers, we could sort of condense it to a single number, right? Instead of two different rents, we could just say, well, the rent went up or down by this amount. Pretty straightforward, right? So that sets up uh, confidence intervals comparing the mean. We'll go a little deeper into uh, two sample comparisons in our next PowerPoint.